Essex was one of those where um, students started actually going to the university based on the things that had happened there and that kind of um, the kind of radical environment that was seen to be existing. That was Dr Esme Hanna on radicalism in English universities during the 1960s. The Germans completely misunderstood what was going on. They said, oh, it's just a few disorganised sheep stealers. They had no idea of, the, of how beautifully organised the Cretans were. And that was Rick Stroud talking about the role that Crete and its people played in the Second World War. You're listening to the History Extra podcast from BBC History magazine. We're the UK's best-selling history magazine, available from all good news agents or via subscription. Check out our latest subscription deals at historyextra.com forward slash subscribe. The magazine is also now available on many digital devices, including the iPad, iPhone, Kindle, Kindle Fire, Google Play, Kobo and Zinio. Look out for us in your app store or newsstand or find out more at historyextra.com forward slash digital. Hello and welcome to our second podcast of December 2014. I'm Rob Attar, the editor of BBC History magazine. The 1960s saw a rise in radicalism in English universities as students staged sit-ins and demonstrations to protest about a variety of issues. Our features editor, Charlotte Hodgman, spoke to Dr Esme Hanna of Leeds Beckett University, who has conducted new research into the topic, about how radicalised English students became during the 1960s and what this meant for the university system. Just how radical was the English student movement of, of the 1960s? Uh, the English student movement of the 1960s um, was, a, was a lot more radical than I think people um, often believe that... Um, the kind of bigger movements or what were perceived as kind of bigger movements, the kind of um, events in, in Paris in May 68, things that went on in America around civil rights, um, events in Germany often seemed much more militant in terms of um, the, those types of movements that there was there was kind of much more um, obvious kind of um, more violent direct action that was going on within those movements and so it was picked up much more um, by the global media at that time but actually there was um, a huge amount of protest going on within English universities between um, sort of mid 60s to mid 70s um, and actually students were very very much committed to um, the issues that they were engaging with and they were very very committed to the idea of social change and wanting to make a difference in, in the social world so yeah there was lots of radicalism. Uh, were the, did the universities encourage this? I mean, how did universities feel about their students doing this? Yeah, it was kind of it was kind of a mixed response, as you as you might imagine. Um, that that a number of the universities were were quite upset by the kind of events that that were going on. That there was still in the kind of late sixties, there was still very much that sort of paternalistic attitude within many of the universities. That that students weren't were seen to be in loco, in loco parentis in many in many cases. That the universities were to look after them uh, while they were away from their families. Um, and so they took that kind of paternalistic role in many ways. And, and actually, you know, university was still seen very much as um, a privilege for the few to go to. And so many of those in authority um, felt, you know, particularly from the, they were kind of a generation or two above those, those students, they, they felt quite upset by the way that which the students were reacting, that in, in some cases that they felt it was a bit dismissive of what the university stood for and, and the right and privilege of the university. Um, other universities dealt with it um, differently and were actually um, more responsive to the students. So, for example, at Hull um, University, they actually um, engaged in dialogue with the students about the issues that were facing the students and actually thought about how they could make changes in terms of having students onto more committees and having so that they had more participation in the kind of processes that went on in the university so that it was more democratic um, rather than it just being very top down, the authority of the university being by those who ruled it. Um, so there were kind of mixed responses, but generally it was, um, yeah, it was 
it was a difficult time for those in authority um, because they were faced with a situation that was kind of unprecedented, really. Um, and you do actually find in some of the documentary evidence that um, vice chancellors would actually write to one another to kind of discuss how best to deal with the situation because it was kind of new territory for them. And, you know, they really wanted to kind of just, just carry on with the kind of business of the university and the students were seen to be in many cases literally in the way if they were sort of sitting in vice chancellor's offices as they were at Leicester um, or in the admin block as they were at Warwick and that, that the business of the university was very much compromised by that so they felt quite aggrieved that those in authority by those kind of actions by the students. And were there some universities that had more of a reputation for having um, an active you know student movement? Yeah definitely um, the LSE in London um, was was seen very much as the kind of forefront of of the student movement. It was the first English university to have a sit-in, um, and so it kind of set the trend in terms of that that use of that mode of tactic f f within protest um, of students sitting in in various locations. Um, but other other universities started to develop slightly more um, kind of radical reputations about events that had gone on. And Essex was one of those where. Um, students started actually going to the university based on the things that had happened there and that kind of um, the kind of radical environment that was seen to be existing. So that's the whole narrative um, kind of worked around that. But, but yeah, some students were some universities were seen to be seen to be much more um, at the kind of forefront of that. But it was happening, you know, across the country. It wasn't just a kind of uh, London centric kind of thing. Um, and it was happening across different types of university. So the LSE being a social sciences university, um, whereas Hornsey, which had the longest sitting um, of in the English student movement, um, was a solely an arts school. So you saw different places having having protests. So, yeah, it, w it was across the board. But, yeah, we, there was th those kind of ideas that some places were kind of at the vanguard of protest. And, I mean, you've mentioned them um, sit-ins. Um, presumably some of these uh, protests, did they, did they get violent? Uh, the majority of the protesting was um, what we would refer to as non-violent direct action, um, so things like sit-ins. Often a lot of the tactics were actually quite educational in focus, that students were, were not trying to shirk being students. They were actually very, very committed to their education. So we saw lots of things like teach-ins or free or anti-universities being set up where the, the curriculum and, and workshops were much more um, loose and free-flowing and, and kind of more as the students wanted their education to be. Hornsey, which had a sit-in for six weeks, um, the students, the kind of, there was a bit of a reputation locally that they were just having a great time. Um, but actually, they, they were very, very diligent about what they did. They, they ran the canteen themselves so that they could, they could feed themselves. Um, they, they would, and people from the local community could come in and have meals. And yeah, they did have fun events and things on an evening like films um, and music and all those types of things. But actually, they had workshops every day, which were minutes were taken. The minutes were then all typed up, which were then fed into a general meeting at the end of every day. So it was actually quite... Um, quite diligent in terms of, of times of those um, those actions, but yeah, there were some uh, protests that were more violent. Um, some events in Cambridge is kind of a really good example of that, um, where there was a protest against um, uh, there was a Greek week that was going on um, within Cambridge, uh, attracting business interests in relation to investments in Greece, and um, students were protesting against the Greek military junta at the time, um, and that actually turned violent in terms of hotel windows being smashed. Um, uh, students causing a lot of trouble, lots of lots of damage in terms of that, and students were actually sent to sent to Borstal as a result of that. And at Essex, there were um, some of the students at Essex uh, later joined the Angry Brigade, who um, were obviously involved in in much more um, violent sort of protest actions. So yeah, there the, there was there was some on the margins, um, more violent action, but that was kind of um, an exception rather than the rule that really. Um, they were very serious about the protest and actually did did taking um, a violent approach actually really add to, in terms of getting their message across and the seriousness of that. And so actually sit-ins, using teach-ins, um, going on demonstrations, those kind of very uh, non-violent tactics were much more, much more popular and common. So were groups of um, students at one university, were they talking to 
students at other universities and sort of making a, a you know a bigger movement oh yes certainly um yeah the documentary evidence shows um students communicating with one another um but often be lots of telegrams being sent to just saying we're in solidarity with you when one student one university went out on strike about something or when they started a city and other universities w- would send them messages of support um so that they felt that they were part of that wider thing and and students would go from different universities so um in in the oral histories that I conducted, um, students that were at Hornsey um, talked about, you know, someone having a Land Rover and driving all around the country and going, going to visit other universities um, and that they would go and talk about what they'd been doing in their issues and, and connect with other students and their issues. Similarly, at Essex, probably due to its geographical proximity to London. You, we would get students going up to London to things at the LSE and the bigger demonstrations against anti-Vietnam, um, those types of things. So there, there was kind of a two-way process going on there because of the geography. But yeah, there, there was very much that kind of collective sense and that, that collectivity was very important to the students in terms of um, being able to connect to, to something that was just beyond their own campuses. And we'd see that in student papers where they would be reporting what was going on at other universities um, and also in the left wing sort of press. So papers like Black Dwarf, they would keep a running kind of tally of what was going on where so that students could kind of keep up with who was doing what and the kind of significance of that. But we also saw... Um, kind of key figures from from events in Paris coming over to talk um, at um, English universities and, and, and getting involved in the events that were going on there. So that sharing was actually um, slightly more global um, in that in the solidarity that was going on, that students saw themselves as part of something. They wanted to change something that was broader than just their universities. And have, from your research, have you um, found any correlation between uh, you know, universities that were camp were sort of campus based um, versus those that weren't as to how radical their students were. Hmm. Um, the campus kind of universities, um, th- there was certainly a lot of radicalism that went on at campus universities. Warwick was um, very radical. Uh, they started what was known as the political files issue in 1970, which kind of spread to other universities, which was about students, uh, files being kept on students um, in terms of their political allegiances um, that often come from um, when they'd... Uh, joined the university from from a level um, and that teachers had written kind of um, personal statements about these students and said well yes he's, he's a nice student but he's in the communist party um, and so uh, we also saw a lot of radicalism at Essex again campus university um, York Lancaster they, they saw radicalism also um, there's something quite specific about the campus university I think in terms of um, the the environment that it creates um, within the, the student movement often um, what enables students to to start protest and to maintain protest um, was about the resources that they had. So somewhere like a university is ideal in terms of resources. Students generally have fairly large amount of free time um, because they're not conducting work. So they're not, you know, in a nine to five situation. Um, at that time, students had grants. So you know, going out on strike wasn't the same as if you were in industry and going out on strike, that you weren't losing pay in terms of that. So their position was fairly comfortable. But also the university has a lot of space. There are lots of big rooms where you can have meetings, um, which enables the students to actually be able to get together and to meet. And and the campus universities, um, perhaps that, that kind of the resource of space is even more so because the students are literally there. They're both living and working there. And often in terms of campus universities, people talk about campus universities being a bubble, that you can, you can exist entirely on a campus university without having to go back into the real world. It, you just be in that environment. Um, and um, in, terms of, in terms of that in the campus universities, that because people lived there, you know, if someone saw there was a meeting occurring, then they would say to the people in their flat, oh, I'm going to this meeting. Do you want to come? And they would. Um, so they, they were able to spread their message in that sort of way. And for example, at Essex, where um, there's a, a central sort of square um, at the sort of heart of the university, you know, students could congregate there. Someone would start talking about some issues and other people would chip in. And so people were, were very easily able to come together in that sort of way that, that even if there wasn't something specifically organised, that something could start quite easily because of, of the population being there. And how effective were, were these um, students? Um, yeah, the kind of the kind of legacy of, of the English student movement is quite interesting. That 
that they had, the, the students often had <laughs> really kind of lofty ambitions in terms of the change they wanted to see in the social world. Um, you know, the 60s was a time of, of real change and, and, and the students were kind of part of that um, in terms of these ideas that, that we could have a better society and, and they, they kind of, they really wanted to see something better. Um, so actually, sometimes we find that those that were involved actually felt a little bit disheartened by what happened. But actually, if we track across time from the student movement to now, we actually see that the, there is a legacy of students being much more involved in the, the running of universities, having much more of a say. So being able to, to sit on, um, you know, the major committees within the university that traditionally would have been run by the vice chancellor and the senior kind of people, figures within that university. Actually, after the 60s and 70s, students started to be, to be on those types of committees and started to have um, more influence in that way. So actually, there is a legacy that exists that, that current students are, you know, are still able to access in terms of that change. So things did change in terms of that. And, and how did English universities compare to sort of a global universities? Was it the same elsewhere? Mm, yeah, the kind of I think the English the the situation in the English universities um, was very specific to um, the context of England. That, um, like I, I said earlier, there was uh, there was kind of more um, sort of ferocious protests going on in in other European countries and and particularly in America. And there are some narratives that suggest that that, that the English student protest was just you know. Um, echoes of the kind of bigger storm but actually it was significant in its own right when we look at it within the context of the kind of political situation within England and um, of kind of you know countries such as France have a much more radical past and they celebrate that much that radical past much more so um, whereas there isn't that same tradition within England so actually in terms of the significance um, the English student movement was significant in terms of in terms of what was going on in England, but but there was differences across across the types across the different countries and and the types of movements and the types of issues that students were facing, but the general sense was about students desiring social change and and wanting to be actors in terms of that social change, and then the, the nuances of that then related to what was specifically going on within not only those countries, but then often, particularly in terms of the English universities, what was going on in, within those specific universities, that they often, often things started in relation to very localised issues and then became much broader. Um, so there are obviously nuances in terms of that. But yeah, the English, the English movement is certainly part of that global trend and we should see it as, a, as an important part of that, certainly. Yeah, I mean, I mean, how have you sort of conducted your research into all this? I mean, presumably, because it's not really that long ago, you've been able to talk to people who were, who were actually there. Yes, definitely. Um, the research was, was kind of broken down into two parts um, because actually very little work has actually been done about um, protests in English universities, that this kind of narrative that it's just uh, sort of an echo of the bigger storm of what went on, the slightly more glamorous protests in, in France, Germany, America, etc. Um, so actually we didn't, there wasn't actually that much previously written. There was, there was um, things that were written at the time by students in relation to what was happening. Um, but yeah, in terms of in terms of how we began to piece together what actually went on, I used two different sources. So the first source was documents, which was archival based, so using university archives, um, and that was a great resource um, in terms of being able to access lots of different kind of views and opinions. So how the vice chancellors felt about things, how the students felt in terms of student union memos and minutes, and those telegrams from other universities and the student newspapers um, and letters from academic staff to one another about what was going on. Um, which is a really, really rich resource um, in terms of that. So that was able to kind of give the broader sense of what went on as a whole. And then, yeah, as you say, um, I was able to speak to, to people that were actually involved in that. And I did three specific case studies that were based on oral history interviews. Um, and those case studies were Essex, LSE and Hornsey. So the LSE being in London, um, so a city-based university, and it was very specifically social sciences, Essex, a campus-based university. Um, has that geographical peculiarity of being out on its own um, and Hornsey as, a, as an art school um, 
again, very different again. Um, so, yeah, I was actually able to interview um, a number of people who attended one of those three universities um, and to, to give them a voice in terms of this, that this is their history. They were involved in it. So it was very important that they were able to tell their story and reflect on it. And it was interesting across those oral histories, uh, seeing not only the similarities in terms of, of the stories that people were telling, but also those differences in terms of how people remember things differently um, or different events that people went to within the same university um, and the kind of different perspectives that people have on that. So the oral histories, I think, were a really important part of that in terms of of trying to get to how students felt about it at the time, what they felt was important, um, and often being able to see what they felt was the kind of impact of it um, across their lives. Yeah, and, and just looking at the, the topic, you know, in a, in a broader sense, um, did you find that um, protests and things like that spiked um, when there were sort of big global events happening? Yeah, um, the time period that I looked at in terms of the English student movement was from 1965 to 1973. That isn't to say that protests didn't occur in English universities ever again at any point um, in relation to that, but that was the real kind of peak sort of trajectory of the movement. And yeah, we certainly see a peak round about 1968 um, where there was more major things going on globally. Um, but different issues tracked across different times. So by the time we moved into, into the 70s, um, there's still a number of protests going on, but it was probably more so around um, rent and rent striking that was going on. So kind of more bread and butter trade union kind of issues um, than the kind of anti-Vietnam stuff that was seen in 1967 and 1968. Um, but yeah, the 68 is kind of the peak. But we have to be careful about this. There's a kind of narrative around 1968 that, that it was all protests occurred in 1968 and that's kind of become quite mythologized um, and so we need to be careful um, about that because there was lots of lots of things going on both before and after that um, and so we have to be careful not to be too kind of narrow in focus but it's interesting when you look um, at kind of the frequency of um, reporting of student protest in, in newspapers you're able to see that 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 kind of curve going up from 1965, sort of peaking 68, 69, and then starting to taper off again as we get into the sort of mid 70s. Um, so yeah, there was certainly a peak in terms of that. Yeah, and just just picking up what you just said about um, about reporting in newspapers. Mm. How how were th these these movements? How were they seen by sort of wider society outside of that university you know bubble? Yeah, again, again kind of um, slightly mixed responses about it. Um, often the letters section of local papers was um, one of the the, the most funny resources I think in terms of how people were um, engaging with them um, one of the local papers in Leicester had some particular gems in relation to this um, where people were writing in expressing their outrage in relation to these long haired layabouts who you know didn't know what was good for them and um, that there was kind of the general population were quite sceptical of what was going on um, and they, they felt that students were quite privileged and that it was in a kind of elite group and what did they really have to complain about. Um, and, yeah, there was that scepticism by the local population. At Hornsey, the local population were quite sceptical of what was kind of going on and there was lots of sort of lurid rumours going around about what, what the students were actually doing um, while they were sitting in at the college. But actually they were able to get out and engage with local people, invite them in and share meals with them, share films with them. And, and that began to break down those barriers. Um, but um, at that time, it, it was a real time of change. And that kind of generational differences um, was really quite stark in many ways. So the kind of long haired young people in, you know, it was it was kind of um, a bit of an alien concept to the, to the older generations and it tended to be those that were kind of narrating those stories in local papers and, and responding to that. But local media certainly picked up on on the student protests um, and certainly certainly discussed it. So, for example, events at Leeds, um, the Yorkshire Post reported quite heavily um, in terms of what was going on. Um, and actually there was an inquiry in relation to the security services, which was one of the protests was in relation to that. Uh, you know, and the Yorkshire Post published the kind of outcome of that, you know, some six or eight months after the protest had actually finished. So it, it was quite a big story in terms of in terms of, of the media. And you do see um, coverage of it in 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 both the broadsheet and local newspapers.
That was Dr Esme Hanna. Esme's book, Student Power, The Radical Days of the English Universities, was published by Cambridge Scholars Publishing last year. Now it's time for the latest history news with our website editor, Evan McFarlane. Traditional views of Viking raiders have been called into question by a new DNA study that reveals women accompanied them on their travels. From a study of Norse DNA, scientists have found that Viking men took significant numbers of women with them in their longboats when they sailed from Norway, Denmark and Sweden to raid coastal settlements overseas. Researchers analysed maternally inherited mitochondrial DNA extracted from 45 Viking skeletons discovered in Norway and found that Norse women played a vital role in the Viking settlements established in Britain and other parts of the North Atlantic. Erica Hagelberg of the University of Oslo said the research, quote, overthrows this 19th century idea that the Vikings were just raiders and pillagers. In other news, members of the public hoping to attend the reburial of Richard III will soon be able to enter a ballot to secure tickets. Leicester Cathedral has announced there will be 200 public spaces at the reinterment service on the 26th of March next year, a third of the cathedral's capacity. Tickets will be assigned randomly after an online ballot, which will run from the 12th to the 31st of December. International applications will be accepted, but half of the public spaces available will be reserved for people who live in Leicestershire and Rutland, said the cathedral. The remains of the last Plantagenet king, who was killed at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485, were uncovered by archaeologists in Leicester in 2012. Earlier this year, Distant relatives of Richard III lost their high court battle over where his remains should be reburied. The Plantagenet Alliance Limited had wished to see him reburied in York. To find out more, visit leicestercathedral.org forward slash ballot. Thanks, Emma. And now we have a short advertisement break. Now showing at the Museum of London, Sherlock Holmes, the man who never lived and will never die. Transcending literature onto stage and screen, Sherlock Holmes continues to fascinate audiences to this day. In this new exhibition, London's first on the detective since 1951, you can see early film, photography and paintings, as well as original Victorian-era artefacts which recreate the atmosphere of Sherlock's London and reimagine the places featured in Conan Doyle's famous stories. Sherlock Holmes, the man who never lived and will never die runs until 12th of April 2015 at the Museum of London. Tickets available online at museumoflondon.org.uk slash Sherlock Holmes. Before our next interview, I'd like to quickly mention our next reader events, which are taking place in March next year. On the 21st and 22nd of that month, we're holding two-day events themed around Magna Carta and Waterloo. At each of these events, you'll get the chance to hear from a selection of expert speakers and enjoy a buffet lunch. For more details and tickets, please visit historyextra.com forward slash events. And if you're a BBC History magazine subscriber, you'll get discounted entry. And you'll also find details of the events in the pages of the magazine, the Christmas issue of which is now on sale. In this month's issue, we explore the controversial reign of Mary Tudor, We examine the mindset of kamikaze pilots. We introduce some of Egypt's most influential female pharaohs and we highlight our books of the year. You can get hold of the magazine in all good news agents and digitally. And now is also a great time to take out a subscription. If you're in the UK, you'll get to choose a fantastic free history book when you subscribe, including new accounts of the Wars of the Roses, Thomas Cromwell and the Battle of Waterloo. To take advantage of this deal please visit historyextra.com forward slash subscribe and it will be available for a limited time only. The Nazi occupation of Crete that followed the German invasion in 1941 was marked by widespread brutality, starvation and the destruction of homes and property. However, the Cretan resistance movement fought back with the help of a small band of British agents. In his new book, Rick Stroud tells a story of one such mission – a plan to abduct a high-ranking German general. Our book's editor, Matt Elton, spoke to Rick to find out more, and he started by asking why he began to research these stories in the first place. What first led me to write this book was that I'd I'd finished a book called The 
Phantom Army of Alamein, which is about the camouflage unit. And I was sitting in France with, and I'm very interested in all things to do with the sec- Second World War, and particularly in, in, in individual events that you can describe as those, you know, as exciting stories, almost as though they were a novel. Uh, and I was sitting in France in a cafe with my wife, uh, who's a publisher, thinking, what can I write next, and going through ideas. And incidentally, we'd also thought uh, of buying a house in Crete. And uh, as, as those two ideas, uh, two thoughts came together, I thought, I suddenly remembered Ill, Ill Met by Moonlight, which I'd seen, I'd read as a, as a sort of teenager, I'd seen the film. The film actually had been on television about um, three years before. And I, I said to my wife, Alexandra Pringle, I said, Oh, goodness, that could be the story that I could write. And I um, immediately uh, got in touch with England. We were in France and got a copy of the book sent to me, which arrived two days later. And I, and I knew then, when I read it, uh, it, it's by William Stanley Moss, who is one of the kidnappers. And although his account is quite is in some places quite dull because he only knows one little bit of the story, I knew that this, if I could really get to grips with this, this is something that um, I could I could really work on. Mm, fantastic. And the story is fascinating. Um, and we'll talk about that, obviously, in much more depth in a minute. What we should start by talking about, I suppose, is the background to Crete um, in the Second World War. For people who might not know, um, how important was the island in the conflict? Uh, the island of Crete was extremely important to both sides as a... Uh, supply place. Uh, I mean, the, the Germans use it as a jumping off point for the battle in, the, uh, in North Africa. Crete's about 400 miles north of the North African cr- coast, so they could land uh, supplies and um, uh, ships, fuel uh, uh, in Crete and get them ready to send on to Tripoli and later on to Tobruk. And what was going on in North Africa was the, the war in the Western Desert. Rommel was moving inexorably uh, eastwards towards Cairo, the British army was reeling back in front of his onslaught. But for Rommel to keep going, I mean, the, the better he did, the longer his supply lines became, and the more reliant he was on petrol. And I mean, an army, a tank army, needs tens of thousands of gallons of petrol. It needs food. It needs uh, ammunition. It's a, it's a very great big. It's a big deal to supply it over. a what became a thousand miles, and Crete was was key in that because they could land the stuff at the port, at the big port in uh, Crete in uh, in Heraklion and in uh, Carnia, uh, and sort of get gather, get themselves together for onward supply. And how how were the inhabitants of Crete treated by the Nazis during the war up until this point that the book um, details the mission? Well, I mean, maybe I could just tell you what what happened. That in um, I think it was April of 1941, the largest airborne force ever mounted uh, um, paratroopers and gliders landed on Crete without uh, warning. Uh, The British army had been thrown back from Greece and had sort of um, was 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 preparing to uh, defend Crete. These heavily armed paratroopers, uh, very, very highly organized, landed and for 11 days they fought not only the, the, uh, the allied forces but almost as importantly the the Cretans rose up, men, women, children, old men, priests, everybody rose up against the German, Germans to fight. And the Cretans have got a very long history of being invaded. So their natural reaction, if you invade Crete, they will go for you. And they, were, and they went for the Germans very, very hard. And tragically, by the end of the first day of the battle, we had nearly won it. We didn't realize it, and we spent the next 10 days of the battle losing it. And, and at that point, the Germans looked at their wounded and said, uh, and their dead, and said, oh, these people have been, these Cretans have treated us very badly. They've mutilated our dead. They've stolen their equipment. They have no right to do this. None of this is necessarily true, but you know, if you leave a body lying in the sun for three or four days, it will rot. So it's very difficult to tell what happened to it. They, the Germans then went sort of mad and uh, destroyed two uh, villages and shot all the inhabitants. And there are harrowing photographs of that happening. And that is what started the resistance. And the, and the people of Crete, uh, almost all of them, there were, I mean, there were some exceptions, there were collaborators, but the people of Crete, who are tough, hard, mountain men and women, uh, did everything they could to make the Germans' lives a misery. And the Germans didn't hesitate to make the Cretans' lives a misery. 
And in my view, it, uh, they behaved as badly on Crete, uh, or even worse, as they, as they behaved in Poland or in um, Russia. Mm. And the German general who was in charge of the island at the time got a reputation for being uh, quite brutal, didn't he? General Muller, he was, um, he was one of the commanders of Crete, and he, was, he came to be known as the Butcher of Crete, and he was the in initial target of the, for the kidnap. I mean, he just, he, he was ruthless. He, he didn't, um, he was a Nazi. He, he would do anything to um, suppress the people and induce fear into them. And he, he even had a sort of private secret police squad whose job was to, was to, int was to make people frightened and fearful. And torture people and, and one German officer after the war said who was so astonished by how brave the Cretans were described the torture of a Cretan guerrilla and he said that what that man suffered for a month was unbelievable and harrowing and he said nevertheless at the end of that month the man who's now a completely shattered human being stood straight and looked them in the eye un unbroken in, the, in his spirit as they shot him oh, that's incredible um, so in the face of this brutality, what kind of things did the resistance uh, manage to do to oppose the Nazi forces? Well, what they, the main thing they did, and they were, uh, shortly after the, uh, after the Germans had won the battle, the British managed to I introduce two types of spy into the, onto the island, or two types of agent. One was the Special Operations Executive, and the other was, the, was called the Inter-Service Liaison Department, which was just a code name. The SOE wanted to blow things up, perform you know, acts of sabotage, the, and, and the Cretans tried to help them do that. And the Cretans themselves did killing of Germans and uh, uh, you know, blowing up motorcycles, blowing up cars. But in a way, the more important thing to do was the collection of intelligence. And that's what the Inter-Service Liaison Department did. And, they, and, the, and the real achievement of the Cretans is that all over the island there were hundreds and hundreds of people who were making small, adding small tiny pieces to the jigsaw of intelligence um, that, 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 that would add up to the big picture of what was going on in, in North Africa and what the Germans were planning to do and they were, you know, these people if they were caught they'd be writing down the numbers of uh, German vehicles, the, the regimental signs on them, the, the badges on the collars of the soldiers. And it was very difficult for a German uh, soldier of any sort to move around the island without being observed. Cretan women infiltrated the German uh, headquarters in Karnia and in Heraklion and, and took out uh, secret documents which were then photographed the photographs were sent to Cairo, where the British, um, the Allied headquarters were, whilst the originals were put back, you know, in the safes or the drawers or wherever, wherever they were. And these these brave women would flirt with the Germans and just appear like sort of, you know, sweet, uh, attractive Cretan girls. But in fact, they were they were deadly agents with a, with deadly intent. Not only that, but revenge was very very high on their on their list, you know, they, they hated the fact that their island had been taken over and that their food was being appropriated and their men and, you know, their men folk were being forced into, into labour. Mm. And of course, while this was all happening, uh, there was a plot being devised in Cairo. Is that the case? There was a plot. There'd been a plot, um, a, a, a chap called um, Tom Dumbarbin, who was a senior SOE officer, had floated a plan in 1942 to capture a German general from his headquarters, or not, not from his headquarters, but from his home on Ariadne. And this plan had been around but was dropped. And then there was an SOE agent called Patrick Lee Fermer who had been, who was on Crete already. He had accidentally been taken back to Cairo because he'd, uh, he'd, he'd rendezvoused uh, on the beach, off the beach with a, a, a British motor launch to deliver some secret papers. He'd gone aboard the launch. As he went aboard the launch, the weather changed very badly, and the south coast of Crete can get very difficult to, to be hove to off on, in a boat. The commander of the um, motor launch said, we've got to go back, and he had to immediately take Patrick Lee Fermer. There was no chance of getting Patrick Lee Fermer back on the beach, so Patrick Lee Fermer found himself in uh, Cairo with uh, not a lot to do, trying to come up with a, with, with a plan and he came up with a plan to, to kidnap General Muller by raiding the headquarters and he then uh, 
um, put this plan to various people, almost all of whom said, yes, great idea. Um, one chap said, no, terrible idea, but um, because he, he was very, very worried about the reprisals that might happen. And that was always a problem. Whatever you did against the Germans, they would immediately do something pretty nasty back to you. And the, and the toll was in uh, what for every German soldier killed, 10 civilians would be killed. Uh, and often much, much worse than that, including, uh, you know, torturing of relatives, blowing up of destruction of whole villages. Anyway, this, the, Lee, Lee Fermer came up with this plan and looked for uh, confederates who would help him. And he, he met a, a 23-year-old Coldstream Guards officer called Billy Stanley Moss. And he also had with him in Cairo, by luck, uh, his, uh, his own Cretan second-in-command, Manolis... Patarakis, an extremely brave man, and uh, a guy called George Tarakis, who'd been sent, who's another Cretan guerrilla fighter, who'd been sent to, to, uh, to um, Egypt to, to uh, be trained as a parachutist. And these men made the rough plan, and then they were flown to Crete with, with an enormous amount of supplies, which included things like coshes and knuckle dusters and explosives, knockout drops. It's like a sort of boy's own paper adventure. Uh, and suicide pills and uniforms that they would change into. As they circled over the, I think it's called the Omelos Plateau, the weather began to close in. Lee Firma parachuted out and was met by the reception team but the weather immediately got so bad that the pilot couldn't and it couldn't lost contact with the ground and had to had to fly back home with with all the, the supplies and the three other key me members of the of the team and it would take about 2 months before those those men would, would got back to the island so Firma was left on the island without his team what did he do, um, do during this time what he did during that time was he he he, he um he developed the plan a bit more. He wrecked it. He had to uh, spend a lot of his time hiding out in the mountains with Sandy Rendell, who was, a, who was the, the local SOE uh, agent. And, you know, a lot of the time these agents spent just trying to pass the time. It was, very, it was extremely boring because you can't be at the Germans, or, you know, every minute of every day. Things have to be planned. You, if you're going to do something, supplies have to be dropped. So... He whiled away, away the time complaining to Cairo that, uh, the, that the drops were, were very badly organized. Cairo tried to get the, tried to re-parachute in the rest of the team and failed time after time. And it, you know, it takes a lot of effort on the ground to get ready to receive a, 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 par a parachute supply and, and agents. And they, they wasted a lot of time. And, um, I think, I think Lee Firma got, um, quite bored. There was also an element to this, which is that they, uh, they had quite a good time on the island. I mean, the the the, the uh, shepherds would feed them about as much drink as they could get down their throats. Raki, you know, lovely rough red wine. They, they were they, they were very hospitable people, the Cretans. And I think Lee Firma, you know, he was popular. He could sing Cretan songs. He could speak Greek. Uh, he, he was a big character. And uh, I think they a lot of the time was spent partying in the mountains. There's stories of them drinking wine before breakfast and things like that. Well, when uh, Billy Moss arrived, he, he knew nothing about Crete. He couldn't speak Greek, and he thought that all the people meeting him were just p sheep thieves. But he said, oh, he said, one quickly learned that uh, one drinks a great deal of uh, red wine before one cleans one's teeth. It's a, it's a substitute for one's uh, cup of tea. So what impression do we get of the various characters involved in this mission? Well, Lee Firmer's 29... Uh, um, William Stanley Moss, Billy Moss is 23. They are the British public schoolboys who want an adventure. And they'd, the extent to which they'd want an, ad an adventure was, um, or they're, they're sort of characters typified by the fact that they lived in Cairo in a house called Tara, where they had a, which they'd rented. It was a, quite a sort of posh place with a butler and cooks and servants and a ballroom. And they would spend their nights... Um, drinking, uh, and they describe how one night they threw a blazing sofa out of the window, another night they encouraged a Polish officer to f shoot out the, the lights on the chandelier with his revolver. You've got a lot of journalists, royal, royalty. I mean, it was a sort of high-octane, high-glamour life. And But when the agents were, were due to be sent off, they'd have a party for them, and the agents would then just leave, and nobody would say goodbye or show any anxiety because um, um, one of the women in this house, a lady called um, 
Sophie Tarnowska said if we showed concern for them, it would mean that something terrible was poss- could possibly happen to them. So we didn't want to do that. So they were, they were sort of buccaneering guys who, who wanted to have a good time and, you know, who were brave. Lee Fermers had a, has been accused of having a sort of, um, secret intent which was which was to do what Churchill wanted and to stop Greece being uh, stop Cairo Crete becoming or Greece becoming a monarchy and that's meant that's thought to have been part of what Churchill had in mind for the SOE in uh, on Greece and in Crete the Cretans for their part were ordinary people I mean they were policemen they were doctors they were on the, a lot of them were sheep farmers who'd spent their lives in the mountains and who knew the mountains and these were tough very good humoured men. I mean, they would. Well, there's one of them called George um, Akumianak, George Sakundakis, who was, who wrote later wrote a book. He was a runner. He would run hundreds of miles over the mountains because it was very difficult to um, maintain radio contact. The radios that they had were were primitive, and the batteries were always failing, and the valves were always failing. Uh, and people like George would carry messages. And if and again, if they were caught, they would be tortured, their families would be uh, shot or beaten up, and, you know, terrible punishments, but but they they were jokers, they were men of humour, and they were men of laughter, and they, were, they loved a joke, and they loved entertaining people, so, you know, tough, brave, do anything, physically um, full of energy, um, and they loved the British, because the British were helping them to defeat the Germans. And they were, in, they were slightly in despair because they, they thought that at any moment a British uh, force would arrive, and particularly um, once we'd beaten the, the Germans in, uh, in North Africa. So when the time came for the mission to take place, uh, the general uh, had changed, hadn't he? Yes, um, Muller was suddenly, at the very last minute, he was uh, posted, uh, I can't remember where he went, I think it was to the Eastern Front. He was, you know, he was sent off to be a, be a villain somewhere else. And this comparatively n- calm Nazi general, nice Nazi, Nazi general, who'd been on the Eastern Front, was sent to Crete uh, to take over his post as second, as second in command of the island. And th- he was sent there to have a holiday. They said, oh, don't worry about the um, Cretan resistance, it's just a few... The Germans completely misunderstood what was going on. They said, oh, it's just a few disorganized sheep stealers. They had no idea of how beautifully organized the Cretans were. And they said, General Kreiper, Herr General, my Lieber, Herr General, go go to Crete. It's warm, it's sunny, you like the classical world, you'll be able to visit the archaeological sites, have a nice long rest. So he wasn't aware of what was going to happen to him um, on this day in April. How, How did that unfold? Not a clue. He didn't have a clue. He did. The only th- sign he had that, uh, the only thought he had was that he knew that there was a place on the road. He said, if I was ever to be um, assassinated, it would be at this place on the road, which turned out to be the place that he was captured. But on, but on the day that it happened, he, he uh, dressed in his ordinary office uniform, light clothes, light shoes, uh, went, was driven by um, Fenska, his driver, to his headquarters, he did a day's work, whatever generals do during the day. Um, I should think that I'm not not that much. And then he was persuaded by his his uh, officers to stay and play a hand of bridge and be a bit um, late. What he didn't realise was that 20 kilometres away, at the very junction that he'd worried about, uh, uh, 13 uh, desperados, guerrillas and SOE agents, were now hiding in the ditches two of them, the British officers, Lee Fermer and Stanley Moss, were disguised as policemen. He didn't realise that his driver had been talking to uh, the, the, uh, the woman who lived next door to his, to his Kripa's house, uh, uh, the Villa Ariadne, and that, that uh, the driver had told this woman, who was, who was actually working for the Secret Service, the, all the general's movement. So at 9.30, he said, at 9 o'clock he said, oh, my, uh, my friends, I've got to go back to my headquarters now, uh, to my home now, you can follow in a car behind, finish your game of bridge. He got in the car and he he sat there, very big, comfortable, brand new Opel Capitan car, top of the range, staff car with beautiful metal pennants flying on it. And as they went down the road in the darkness, he saw ahead two policemen and he thought, he said to the driver, ah, this is good. I I said that might be a problem area and here already my men have... uh, set up a roadblock block to protect me. The, the driver 
drew to a halt. Uh, he heard a voice saying Papieren bitter. It was a German, apparently a German policeman asking for his papers. And another voice said, is this, this, these are the Generalswagen, which means is this the general's car? Yeah, 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 oh, that's good. And then just as he began to sort of look up to smile and congratulate the policeman, the doors of the car were ripped open. Lee Firma grabbed him by the uh, lapels of his, of his uniform, hoiked him out of the car, jabbed a, a pistol in his chest and said, handy hoch, you know, hands up. And they began to have a fight. All the, the uh, 11 resistance workers who were hiding in the ditches thundered over to the car. Stanley Moss dragged, uh, hit the driver over the head with the kosh. He had a what's called a life preserver. I don't know, God knows why it's called a life preserver. It's a life, life taker. But he, he whacked the, the um, driver very hard over the head and the driver got kicked in the head by another of the... Um, uh, of the resistance who, who, who'd arrived. Moss leapt in the car, turned the engine on, or ch I think actually the, t the engine was still running. Uh, Lee Firma put on the, the general's hat. Uh, the the guerrillas tied, b b got the general on the ground, tied his hands behind his, handcuffed his hands behind his back, tied his feet up, bundled him onto the floor. So he was lying along the floor in the back of the car. They leapt into the back of the car. You can imagine how shocking this is. This is a man who, Everybody says, yeah, yeah, my Herr, lieber Herr Genor, who, you know, he gets treated with great respect. He, everybody sort of bows and scrapes when he, wherever he goes. Suddenly, he's in the back of the car, lying on the floor, with a load of filthy shepherd boots on, on his chest and on his face, knives to his throat, hard um, shepherd's hands over his, over his mouth, uh, and p speaking a language of anger and um, uh, revenge that he can't understand. And within, Ill I think it was 90 seconds, of them waving the car down, they were speeding uh, towards Heraklion, whilst the um, whilst the other the uh, other uh, members of the party started to take the driver across the mountains to a rendezvous point, viewpoint, a rendezvous point, and uh, to, uh, leaving two more people just to clear everything up to leave no no evidence. And um, the uh, Moss, uh, sorry. Um, Yes, Stanley Moss was a very good driver. Stanley Moss was an extremely good driver, and he drove at speed towards Heraklion. and they thought the best way to, to, to deal with this is to drive straight through one of the main uh, towns of, uh, of the German occupation, one of the main centers of the occupation, rather than get, trying to go the other way. They felt we'll go straight through it, and we'll leave the car an hour outside Heraklion. We'll leave it with a note in it saying this is an entirely British operation, it's nothing to do with the Cretans and so don't take reprisals on them and the fact that this car was very well known and that it had the general's pen steel pennants on each, on each of the wings helped them get through 22 manned, armed German roadblocks and Lee Firma would shout out of the car as they approached a roadblock Generalswagen, Generalswagen and all the soldiers would sort of leap to attention and salute and raise the barriers and the car got through in Heraklion itself the um, the German version they had to drive right through the German version of the PX the NAFI s surrounded by soldiers who were all you know slightly drunk all, all in, on an evening out past the cinema where the soldiers had been watching a, f a film uh, on on through more and more um, roadblocks till they got to the what's called the Carnia Gate the West Gate which was had you know, we've all seen shots of uh, roadblocks in, in Helmand province and uh, in Northern Ireland. It, it, there was like those great concrete blocks in the road, and loads of uh, German soldiers armed, searchlights. Moss drove, drove slowly through the concrete blocks, you know, the chicane of the blocks. Had to, the, a, a German soldier, big German soldier, came out in front of him and looked as though he wouldn't uh, stand aside, held his hand up and so he went, Alter! Uh, and... Moss slowed right down and uh, Lee Firma pulled the same trick. General Zagen and the soldier at the last minute stood aside and let the general's car go through and they were through the city, through the danger uh, and, and heading towards comparative safety and a place where they would um, leave, leave, abandon the car and make it look as though the general was being taken f um, off, off a submarine uh, landings place on the north coast. In fact, the plan was to take him across the mountains to the south coast. Um, so what do we make of the relationship between the captors and their captive? 
Well, it's very um, interesting because some of uh, immediately uh, on the capture, one of the Cretans stuck his head through the car door, uh, and a very important Cretan who was the, called Mickey, who was the Mickey Akuminakis, who was the head of counterintelligence, swearing and screaming at the general and hating him. And Lee Firma said, sh- sh- I mean, he said in, in Greek, shut up, Mickey, go away, we've got to get off. And they drove off. The Cretans in the back of the car for that, in that first two hours really didn't like the general. And he thought, oh, my, my goodness, I'm going to be killed now. But as the, as the um, adventure unfolded, it took them the better part of 14, 15, maybe 16 days to walk him across the mountains. Some of the Cretans, A, he was a phenomenon. All the Cretans in the villages they passed through would sort of come out to look at him. It's as though Robin Hood had, been take, had caught the Sheriff of Nottingham. And sort of, um, some of the Cretans, some of the guerrillas would try and uh, uh, sort of unhinge him by staring at him and muttering at him. Some of the guerrillas got to quite like him. And um, although he couldn't speak Greek, he became very impressed. He suddenly realized that these weren't disorganized peasants. They were people who knew what they were doing, who would, had been monitoring his army's every move. And he, at one point he said to Lee Firma, he said, I just wonder who's in charge of this island, you, me, we, us Germans or you British? And amongst the two uh, British SOE um, agents, Lee Firma, he got on with, and there's a classic now... Um, I think fairly well known moment when they're sitting high on high in the mountains in the, in the uh, on Mount Ida and he stares up and he can see snow and he begins to, he being the general and he begins to quote in Latin an ode from Horace which I can't remember exactly how it goes but he, he quoted the first verse and, and the translation is low see how the uh, see how the snow glitters in you know in the sun and Lee Firma finished the, the ode. I mean, it's quite long. And it was the one ode in Latin that he knew completely. And he finished it. And the general and he looked at each other. And, and the general went, Ach, so her, uh, her Major. And Lee Firma says that he felt a weird bond. That He said, it's as though we'd both drunk from the same pool. And nothing was ever the same between us again. They shared this cultural background. Um, Moss, on the other hand, uh, hated the general and wrote in his, you know, he, he tried to help the general at one point by getting, the general said, I'm so bored, because they had, again, there was a lot of waiting to do whilst people went, you know, found the way ahead and checked. And Moss found him a, uh, the, a, thousand, a German version of the A Thousand One Nights. Goodness knows where he got it from, this book. But the, the general looked at it and said, oh, I don't... After moaning on, he was also moaning about, you know, that he'd hurt his leg and that he was ill and that, you know, he was unhappy, etc., etc., as who wouldn't be, you know, to suddenly... And he said, oh, um, I don't want this book. And um, in, I think they were speaking in sort of pidgin French now, which is the only language that they, that they shared. Moss, Moss couldn't speak German. And... Moss lost his temper and, to- and screamed at him and said, shut up, stop moaning. And they've spent two or three days, sit- they had to sit near each other um, with Moss sulking. And Moss wrote in his diary, uh, he wrote the words uh, about the incident of shouting at the general. He said, oh, well, I could have killed him. And later on, he wrote in his diary, I would like to kill every German on the island. I mean, he was, remember, he's only 23, so he's not the most mature of people. And, and later on, uh, when he was... Uh, he, after the war, uh, he was, the general was talking about the capture, and he said, well, he said, Paddy, he said, I liked Paddy, we got on, he said, but Moss, he said, oh, he was so infantile, he was a child, he kept waving his pistol at me. And, and that, so, there was a whole range of emotions, and I, and I think when they came to leaving him, when he, they take him off the beach, quite, uh, uh, my understanding of it is, and, I, and I'll tell you why I've got this understanding in a, in a second, if you like, is that some of them were quite sort of, they become quite sort of fond of him. It's the Stockholm Syndrome, I think. And he of them, I mean, he, he came to uh, admire the Cretans a lot, and, he's, and he asked one of them at one point in a, in a terrible, wet, damp, cold cave, he, he saw how they were looking after the British, and one of the, one of the Cretans said, oh, I need to go into Heraklion, has anybody got a pass? And four people produced... Um, counterfeit German passes, all, all perfect. So he said, he said, I don't understand this. And I said, I, I don't understand why you're so nice to the British. And a woman who was in the cave with them said, well, because you have treated us with great dishonor. You've, um, you've tried to turn us into slaves, and the British are just here to help us, and, that, and that's the reason. 
that we like them. Yeah. So what happened to Kruiper after he left the island? Where was he sent then? He was taken uh, by torpedo, no, uh, motor launch, fast motor launch to um, a, a port called Mirza Matru, which is on the Egyptian coast, where he was met by a load of uh, senior British officers, all beautifully done up, all saluting him. And that's uh, suddenly, the, you know, the respect of rank was reaccorded to him. He was treated, uh, he, he'd, broke, he'd hurt his arm quite badly in several falls, uh, and he was then taken, um, that night he was taken, he had dinner with a, with a senior British officer, and they spoke, who spoke German, and they shared a room, and he, he could be heard talking away about, about the war. He was then taken to London, where he was debriefed, I mean, which means in, interrogated, and, and asked what he knew about the German forces and the, and the morale of the German army. And the, the, the officer doing, the interrogating officer concluded, and I've read, I've held the report and I've read it. He said, a not very interesting, slightly unintelligent officer, uh, who might, who might join the, um, you know, the, 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 the anti-Nazi, um, officers in, he might join General Thomas, who'd been, who was Rommel's second in command, who'd been, captured at the at the Battle of Alamein. Uh, he never did. And then he was then taken to Canada uh, and he spent the war in the rest of the war as a, as a prisoner and was released in 1947. You mentioned there that there were um, kind of repercussions to the people of uh, Crete. Um, what form did these take? Well, what happened was that the um, uh, as they were being as they were getting the, ge the general off the island, 2000 um, German soldiers surrounded the mountain that they were coming down and, so, and cut off the beaches and they could hear several villages being blown up. Now, Lee Fermer always claimed, oh, well, they weren't blown up because of what we were doing. They were, be, they were being blown up as repri reprisals for things that had happened a few months before. But the, the, the trouble is, if, you, if, you're, if I poke a wasp's nest and the wasps all fly at me, I can't say, oh, well, I'd, I only poked one wasp, but all the others, they were doing something else. You know, they, they, he'd poked the wasp's nest, and um, uh, leaflets were dropped saying, we are going to blow up uh, and, and take terrible reprisals on the village of Anoya for three reasons. And one of those reasons was that the people of the village of Anoya, which was a strong resistance centre, had harboured the general. And, and it says in the leaflet, because you harboured... General Kreiper, and they, you know, they were, uh, and when they blew somewhere up, they, did, they didn't do it by halves. I mean, they first of all dive-bombed it, and then they sent the engineers in with explosives, and they did it, and they, sh and they rounded people up, men and women, uh, men and children, men and young boys, and shot them. It was not a very sort of, you know, it wasn't, it was, there was a very serious side to this operation, and Lee Fermer, as, as, I, as I might have said to you just now, spent a lot of his, the rest of his life trying to prove that there were no reprisals, and I think he was wrong. If there was one misapprehension about this period and about the war more generally that you'd like this book to uh, change, what would that be? Um, a misapprehension about the war generally. I think, I don't think this war, this, I don't think this book, I mean, I think that this book, it's not in terms of the war more generally, but I think that if I wanted anything to be changed by this book, it would be to redress the balance between the glamorous SOE who are sort of upper middle class, very, very sort of delightful people, but they, they, they took all the oxygen away from the Cretans. And I think that, I don't think that, that this book would address anything to do with the war more, more, more generally, but it will. I've tried to tell this story as much from the heroically brave Cretan point of view, and they are, Crete is an island of total heroes that was rick stroud kidnapping crete the true story of the abduction of a nazi general is out now in the uk published by bloomsbury in the us it will be published next spring but it is already available for the kindle and just before we go i'd like to read out a couple of messages from listeners that have come in recently firstly here is david cod who describes himself as an irishman living in germany David writes, I just needed to congratulate you on a most excellent series of historical podcasts. There's nothing better than travelling the Autobahn and listening to one of your wonderful reports. I especially want to draw notice to the aid your interviews with authors give me in the choice of books I purchase. 
A 20-minute chat with an author can really influence one's reading material. Thanks for that, David. And we also heard a little while back from Cathy Martin in Miami Shores, who says, Your last two podcasts were the best in recent memory. I found the history of humanity revelatory and Joan of Arc fascinating. I recommended them to my husband, who was also impressed. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Cathy, and if you missed either of those episodes, you can still download them from all the usual places. They are broadcast on the 25th of September and the 2nd of October, respectively. And if you enjoy history podcasts, don't forget to download our new History of Britain special episode, which is available for free from our website. You'll find it at historyextra.com forward slash Britain podcast. And you'll need to be logged in to access it, but don't worry if you've not already registered, because it's free to do and very simple. And that's pretty much it for this week. Do join us next time when we'll be talking about kamikaze pilots with Christopher Harding, and Peter Firstbrook will be discussing Pocahontas. Thanks for listening to this History Extra podcast, which was produced by Jack Fletcher. Do let us know what you think about this episode by emailing podcast at historyextra.com and we might read out your messages in future episodes. Alternatively, why not keep in touch via Twitter or Facebook, where you'll find us at History Extra. For more great history content, don't forget to visit our website, historyextra.com, where you will find history quizzes, galleries, articles, and more. Plus, it's where you can download every single previous episode of this podcast. 